President Donald Trump is entering his second year in office, a leader whose unconventional style has shaken up the Washington establishment and America's standing around the world. Hello, I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. In this half hour, we look back and we look forward. We'll examine President Trump's handling of major threats to world peace from North Korea to the Middle East. We'll see how he's changing the fates of people who want to live in the US and immigrants who are already here. And we'll ask American voters how they feel about their president one year after putting him in office. We begin with a story that has haunted the administration from its beginning. Did the Donald Trump campaign collude with Russian efforts to influence the 2016 presidential election? Here's White House reporter Peter Heinlein with a review of the ongoing investigation. I have nothing to do with Russia. Everybody knows it. That was a Democrat hoax. It was an excuse for losing the election. This was Donald Trump at year's end, pushing back against allegations that he is soft on the Kremlin, possibly as a payback to Russia for helping him beat Hillary Clinton for the presidency. In January, two weeks before Trump was sworn in as president, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper's office issued a finding that the CIA, FBI, and NSA had together concluded that Vladimir Putin tried to ensure a Trump victory. Putin, it says, ordered a campaign to denigrate Secretary Clinton and harm her electability, and that Putin developed a clear preference for Trump and aspired to help Trump's election chances by discrediting Clinton. The finding prompted immediate congressional investigations. In March, FBI Director James Comey confirmed that his agency too had a probe, looking into possible collusion between Trump's team and the Kremlin. Soon after, Trump fired Comey. That led to the appointment of special counsel Robert Mueller, whose far-reaching Russia probe has already netted indictments and guilty pleas of several Trump campaign officials on peripheral charges. As president, Trump's words and his deeds have at times seemed to be at odds with each other. He recently approved the sale of lethal weapons for Ukrainian forces fighting Russian-backed separatists and signed into law new sanctions against Moscow for its actions in Ukraine though he called the legislation seriously flawed. But in speeches, he still talks about trying to improve relations with the Kremlin. And I feel that having Russia in a friendly posture, as opposed to always fighting with them, is an asset to the world and an asset to our country, not a liability. His national security strategy casts Russia as a dangerous competitor that seeks to weaken America's global influence using subversive measures to undermine the legitimacy of democracies. But in a speech unveiling the strategy, Trump talked of building a partnership with Putin. Well, yesterday I received a call from President Putin of Russia thanking our country for the intelligence that our CAA was able to provide them concerning a major terrorist attack planned in St. Petersburg, where many people, perhaps in the thousands, could have been killed. They were able to apprehend these terrorists before the event with no loss of life, and that's a great thing, and the way it's supposed to work. Analysts say Russia has become the prism through which Trump's every move is viewed, putting the president in the position of possibly being tougher on the Kremlin than he might otherwise have been. It's almost as if he's trying to overcompensate so that people won't um, assume the worst about him in Vladimir Putin. So you saw recently the... Donald Trump's second year in office promises to be, like the first, dominated by Russia as special counsel Robert Mueller's probe is moving inexorably toward a conclusion, and the president pushes back as he faces off on the world stage with the only person ranked by Forbes magazine as more powerful than he, Vladimir Putin. Peter Heinlein, VOA News, the White House. President Trump would like Russia to support the U.S. showdown over North Korea's nuclear threats. That country's leader, Kim Jong-un, is ignoring trade sanctions and is working toward direct talks with South Korea. VOA's Brian Padden looks at Trump's handling of a crisis that could lead to war. 
In the last year, President Donald Trump has made ending the North Korean nuclear threat a national security priority. And he's raised all kinds of expectations about what he is going to do about North Korea. And if he doesn't do those things, then it, it seriously, it threatens his identity, it undermines him, it undercuts him. In April, on the same day, President Trump dined with Chinese President Xi Jinping at his Florida Mar-a-Lago resort. He ordered a unilateral missile strike on Syria for allegedly using chemical weapons against civilians. Trump's demonstration of military force, his supporters said, sent a message to Xi that if China did not act to curtail North Korean provocations, the U.S. would. Trump found a strong supporter for his hardline North Korea policy in Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. However, South Korea, after the impeachment of conservative President Park Geun-hye, elected liberal Moon Jae-in, who supports strong deterrence, but opposes the use of U.S. offensive military force on the Korean peninsula. President Moon has been quite clear uh, that he believes that uh, uh, war on the Korean Peninsula should never be considered an option unless the North Koreans start at first, of course. While U.S. proponents of military intervention argued in favor of preventive war to eliminate the North Korean nuclear threat, U.S. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis cautioned that the casualties from such action would be tragic on an unbelievable scale. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson on several occasions moved to support unconditional talks they with leaders in Pyongyang, but Trump much. repeatedly Thank rebuked you. his top diplomat, adding to speculation that the president may soon replace him. Trump instead has used inflammatory rhetoric, warning North Korea would face fire and fury, and calling Kim Jong-un a rocket man on a suicide mission. Pyongyang would back down from a threat to send an ICBM into waters near the U.S. Pacific territory of Guam, but launched two long-range missiles over Japan and in September conducted its sixth nuclear test. At the United Nations, the U.S. and its allies convinced China and Russia to support stronger international sanctions that ban the North's lucrative coal and mineral exports and cut off one-third of its oil imports. In November, North Korea announced it had reached its goal of developing operational ICBM capability after conducting its most powerful missile test to date. North Korea's recent agreement to participate in the Olympics in South Korea will likely bring a needed pause in provocations. Trump for now is supporting inter-Korean talks, but remains skeptical that diplomacy with North Korea will work. Brian Patton, VOA News Seoul. President Trump changed America's direction on several foreign fronts last year. It is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That announcement took many by surprise. Trump's move, which sparked worldwide protests, was a reversal of long-standing U.S. policy that Jerusalem's status must be decided by negotiation. On Iran, Trump cheered protesters rallying against their government and has threatened to end the nuclear containment deal brokered by President Obama. Trump did pull America out of the Paris Climate Accord, the only country to do so. He criticized NATO as unfair to American interests. And he withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Pact. The Trump administration's clearest military victory was beating back the Islamic State, a persistent ground campaign by Iraqi government troops and coalition-backed forces in Syria, combined with Western air power, finally forced the terror group to retreat to the shadows. VOA's Jeff Selden shows us how it happened. The Islamic State terror group made sure 2017 got off to a bloody start, sending a shooter into the Reina nightclub in Istanbul, killing 39 people on January 1st. But the shock of the deadly terror attack masked a different reality in Iraq, where Islamic State was on its heels as security forces pushed into Mosul, the Iraqi capital of the group's self-declared caliphate. The enemy collapsed in front of us, leaving their weapons and equipment, and ran away after we inflicted heavy losses on them. In the U.S., a new president warned Islamic State and groups like it would face annihilation. 
As part of the stepped up effort, the U.S. sought to empower anti-Islamic state forces for the first time, providing the SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces, with armored vehicles as they began a new push toward the terror group's Syrian capital of Raqqa. Yet, as Islamic State faced more pressure in Iraq and Syria, its influence could be felt elsewhere. In February, an apparent IS sympathizer used a machete to attack guards outside the Louvre in Paris. And the terror group claimed a Palm Sunday attack, killing dozens in Alexandria, Egypt. IS also flexed its muscles in Pakistan and Afghanistan, claiming a march attack on a Kabul hospital, killing more than 30. The U.S. response? dropping its largest non-nuclear bomb on a key Islamic State cave and tunnel complex in Afghanistan. By July, Islamic State's self-declared caliphate was in tatters. It's Iraqi capital of Mosul, liberated after months of fighting. I announce from here to the entire world the end, failure, and collapse of the mythical and terrorist Islamic State. Rejoicing in Raqqa as IS fighters fled the self-declared caliphate's Syrian capital. Yet, even as Islamic State lost territory and fighters, its global reach was felt in attacks on Stockholm, Paris, Barcelona, and New York. ISIS is clearly demonstrating continued ability to pursue its global war. The terror group apparently heeding the advice of its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, in an audio recording from September. The path to victory, Baghdadi said, is to be patient and resist. Jeff Selden, VOA News, Washington. The Islamic State may be marginalized in Syria, but the group remains active and deadly. They claimed responsibility for bombings in Afghanistan, including that blast at a Shia cultural center in Kabul that killed more than 40 people and injured dozens more. U.S. officials are concerned about where the group could try to create its next hub, and Africa might be a likely target. As VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb reports, the U.S. military is trying to prevent Islamic extremists from taking advantage of a continent with vast, ungoverned spaces. Poverty, political disillusionment, and masses of young, unemployed Muslims. Those are ideal conditions for Islamic extremism, and they are all found in... If we're trying to look in the future, it's, it's actually happening now that Africa is going to be the spot. It's going to be the hot spot. The entire African continent has less than half the number of American troops deployed in Afghanistan. But increases in terrorist activity are among the reasons why the American military presence has grown rapidly on the continent. There is African concern that the U.S. approach is becoming rather more militarized or more concerned with military and security issues than had been the case in the past. John Campbell, who served as ambassador to Nigeria under President George W. Bush, told VOA the main thrust of effort on the continent should be on what he calls the root causes of extremism, lack of economic development and poor governance. U.S. Africa Command, which oversees military activities on the continent, aims to strengthen local African militaries to combat Islamic extremists. The administration this year expanded the authority to strike al-Shabaab and Islamic State fighters in Somalia, allowing offensive strikes against the militants, rather than just strikes defending African allies and their American advisors. It, it definitely helps because we're doing our best to go ahead and employ our assets to help them out in any way we can. But the war against extremism in Africa has not come without a cost. A U.S. Navy SEAL died aiding Somali security forces against al-Shabaab in May, and four American soldiers were killed in an October Islamic State ambush in Niger. If the security needs grow in coming months, more American troops could find themselves facing dangerous situations across the African continent. Carla Babb, VOA News, the Pentagon. Coming up after a break, how immigrants in America are faring under the Trump administration and the unconventional relationship the new president has with the press. We'll be right back. VOA reaches 51 million adults every week across Africa. We do news, features, analysis, talk, and social media outreach. 
But exactly how do we cover the news? Well, this is how we do it. How we cover these top stories, uh, for example, the story on uh, Boko Haram, is uh, first of all by preparation. You feel the danger all the time. When I was in Meduguri, the heartland of Boko Haram, every day I have to change where I sleep because of the fear. Just blend into the society, nobody knows you are from the uh, Voice of America. But it is very dangerous, it is very tough, but if you prepare well, you always get your story. So at VOA, that's how we do it. I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. Welcome back. President Donald Trump is resetting the rules on immigration, including who comes into the country and who can stay. His executive actions have been met with strong opposition and legal challenges. But for the many people affected, Trump's decisions have led to a year of personal upheaval. Ramon Taylor reports. A year of promises. We have to establish borders and we have to build a wall. And threats to decades old U.S. policy. The RAIS Act prevents new migrants and new immigrants from collecting welfare. Under the premise of securing the country's borders and boosting the economy, have come as a blessing to President Trump's base and anathema to millions more. Among them, undocumented millennial workers brought to the U.S. as children, beneficiaries of temporary protected status, refugees, and travelers from several mostly Muslim countries. In diversities like New York, many spoke out. This is about Trump consolidating power through fear. It has nothing to do with making us safe. But the hope of establishing a future in the U.S. has become more uncertain. After a year of court battles, Trump's travel order is for now in effect for travelers from eight countries, six of them majority Muslim. Separately, his government cut the total number of refugees by more than half in 2017, even fewer in 2018. The next big push is family-based or chain immigration. Family-based immigration policy in existence since 1965 would be replaced with a merit-based approach that would cut legal immigration in half. Trump has also promised to get tough on illegal immigration, but the U.S. Immigration Agency removed some 14,000 fewer people than in 2016. Still, the number of immigration arrests increased, and immigration enforcement is staffing up. Meanwhile, beneficiaries of temporary protected status from Haiti, Sudan, and Nicaragua are set to become illegal in coming months after their TPS benefits were ended. In September, Trump ended the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, program for almost 800,000 young people brought to the country illegally as kids. Congress will have to decide their fate before March 2018 and Trump's signature promise to build a big, beautiful wall along 1,600 kilometers on the southern border has been reduced to a down payment of 119 kilometers in 2018. Ramon Taylor, VOA News, New York. Well, even before taking office, Donald Trump launched a running feud with many of America's most influential media institutions, accusing them of spreading fake news about him. His comments have helped deepen the partisan divide about the trustworthiness of the news people receive. And it has had an impact in countries where the press is not so free. VOA White House correspondent Peter Heinlein reports. If you want to discover the source of the division in our country, 
look no further than the fake news and the crooked media. which would rather get ratings and clicks than tell the truth. President Trump often hits back at coverage he doesn't like. He's used the term fake news in no fewer than 180 tweets since Inauguration Day, as well as in countless speeches, interviews, and comments. Press freedom activists say Trump's strategy is having an effect. I mean, he's very eager to have um, uh, Twitter, uh, mainstream news organizations pick up his tweets and write about them and uh, amplify them. So he is, uh, in, one, in, in one regard, pretty sof sophisticated about this. This is an apple. Stung by the attacks on their integrity, major media outlets have come up with new slogans and ad campaigns like CNN's Apple to defend themselves. Press watchdog groups say authoritarian leaders are following Trump's lead. We saw the term fake news being used in the Philippines, in Russia, in China, in Egypt, um, to justify their own repression of the media for their own attempts to delegitimize journalists. The phenomenon is spreading. Syria's President Bashar al-Assad dismissed human rights reports about deaths in military prisons by saying, we live in a fake news era. Authoritarian leaders from Thailand's Prayut Chan Ocha to Cambodia's Hun Sen and Malaysia's Najib Razak have talked about fake news. Singapore is said to be considering a fake news law in the new year. That has seemed to embolden those leaders in thinking that what they're doing is acceptable, um, that they can get away with it, that there won't be chastising on the part of the U.S. government. Trump has welcomed several authoritarians to the White House. He hailed Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan as a friend, despite Turkey's reputation as the world's leading jailer of journalists. The Committee to Protect Journalists says the number of reporters jailed in 2017 hit an all-time high for the second year running. Peter Heinlein, VOA News, The White House. We'll take a break, but coming up, the views of American voters will take you to a rural California community to find out what people there think about their new leader. Back in a moment. We get interviews with people that matter as a result of getting to know the story and getting to know the story behind the story and getting to know views and opinions of people in the street. Once you have all these encapsulated into one, you will then draw the plan of getting to know these individuals who make the news. Covering a health story, uh, very often I start by looking at the breaking news. It's good to have local contacts that will keep you up to date with what's going on. The Voice of America was very much on top of uh, the coverage of the Ebola crisis. We spoke to colleagues, we spoke to experts, and uh, I talked about Ebola on my show before Ebola was all over the news. You have to listen to the viewers. So at VOA, that's how we do it. For Zimbabwe, VOA Studio 7 has news and information in English, Shona and Indebele, with its interactive radio on TV program, Live Talk. Our Portuguese town hall call-in show, Angola Follow Saw, joins audiences with leaders in politics and the arts, all on Facebook Live. Each week, Vuze Nu brings together the best of stories about entrepreneurs and innovators in Africa and the United States. We're covering the latest technology from the United States in ways that engage younger audiences. In Africa, our correspondents are there with first-hand reporting for affiliates across the continent and for audiences around the world. Welcome back. 
During his first year in office, President Trump was plagued by low approval ratings among American voters. His angry tweets, friction with members of Congress and controversies over race relations have alienated many people. But he has had his share of victories. He placed a conservative justice, Neil Gorsuch, on the Supreme Court. The stock market and other economic indicators have continued to soar. And he was able to get a tax cut package through Congress. Trump supporters in rural America are pleased, and they say national opinion polls are not accurate, and politicians in both parties and the media are working to undermine the president. VOA's Mike O'Sullivan reports for us from Lassen County, California. This rural county in northeastern California, along the Nevada border, backed Donald Trump by more than three to one in the 2016 election. Rancher Jeff Hemphill stands behind the president in spite of his critics. I think Trump's doing a fantastic job, and I applaud him to ha for having the character that he does. I think a lot of lesser men have just quit by this time. Voters here are frustrated with a slow economy and strained finances for community services. The last lumber mill in the once thriving town of Susanville shut down 10 years ago this radio talk show host responded to Trump's message. His message was, hey, we're gonna take care of the little guy. I'm concerned, yeah, I think that really resonated um, through folks like myself uh, across the aisle here in, in the rural communities, the forgotten. Lassen County covers more than 12,000 square kilometers of mountains, rivers, and lakes. More than 60% of workers are employed by government and 60% of the land is owned or controlled by a branch of government with environmental and other restrictions. That frustrates many voters who have an independent streak. 100% redneck conservative, and we're also very religious here. Nearly half of voters are registered Republicans. One in five is a Democrat, and one in five is independent. Not everyone likes Trump. Uh, I'm really frustrated with it. I feel like he is working to divide the country. I really worry about the future of our country, and, and it's not necessarily him, it's the actions that he's taking in terms of who he's appointing uh, to positions that run some of our agencies. Others say Trump is doing what he promised, clearing the swamp of Washington politics. He's staying on point, he's doing things, maybe not as fast as he should because he doesn't have a lot of support, but I do believe the people are behind him. I would vote for him again. On immigration, tax reform, opening federal lands to private development, Trump mostly gets high marks here. I wish you would stay off Twitter. Um, I think sometimes he has a tendency to maybe go off topic, but um, I think he's doing what he said he was gonna try to do. And whatever the mood in San Francisco or Washington, these voters say Trump is keeping his promises and has kept his support in rural Lassen County. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Susanville, California. The U.S. president is elected to a four-year term of office. Thank you for joining us for this special report on Donald Trump's first year. For the very latest developments on the Trump presidency, do visit our website, voanews.com. I'm Heidi Adams-Fitzpatrick in Washington. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.